more to that story. You know? <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hey, Steve. So you can play in front. There's five officers that got shot in Houston. Oh, yeah. Are they okay? Are they okay? There's, there's no... We don't have an update yet. I know. It's just crazy. Welcome, everyone, those here in the council chambers and those viewing at home to the St. Charles County Council meeting of January 28th, 2019. This evening, we have Reverend Debbie, Debbie Bartley, from the associate pastor from the First Charles United Methodist Church, to give the invocation. And after that, we'll have Mike Klinghammer give the Pledge of Allegiance. So everybody, please rise. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come together tonight and we give you thanks for this day. We ask that you make your presence known to us here tonight. The council's tasks are great and our needs are many. Give to this council a discerning hearts that will enable them to stand in the gap for those who are silent or who are silenced by others. And in this cold weather, we are especially mindful of those for whom housing and a safe place to stay tonight are elusive. We ask your protection upon all who serve selflessly to ensure that our basic needs and our safety are met. We ask that you send your blessings upon our county executive, the members of the council, and all those serving in St. Charles County's government. Give them an extra measure of wisdom and courage and grace as they go about doing their jobs. And it is with grateful hearts that we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we have roll call, please? Councilmember Joe Cronin. Councilmember Joe Brazel. Here. Councilmember Mike Elam. Here. Councilmember John White. Here. Councilmember Mike Klinghammer. Here. Councilmember Terry Hollander. Councilmember Dave Hammond. Thank you. First thing on our agenda tonight is uh, traffic regulations, a public hearing. So anybody wishing to come forward? On that topic, please do so. I will. Our first speaker would be Sabrina Wren. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Sabrina Wren, and I am a resident of unincorporated St. Charles County. And I will tell you, I'm a former teacher, and so I'm really interested that you all are good students. Um, <laughs> Safety is the most important consideration that we are, um, with that we should be using in making this decision about increasing speed limits. Councilman Brazel told us that on January 7th, and the engineer who appeared here also said the same thing. And the literature on setting safe speed limits also says the same thing. It's all about safety. Some area residents requested an increase in speeds on three of the roads in my neighborhood because they say they don't want to be lawbreakers and they don't want any more tickets. These are not safety reasons. Two non-resident proponents offered other reasons. One said the roads are flat farm roads, so you can drive fast on them. The facts presented on January 7th show that this is incorrect. In fact, Morrison, Forestell, and Oberhelman are very hilly with limited sight distances, deep ditches along both sides, no shoulders, and a dilapidated bridge at the end of one of the roads that's just a, a place waiting for an accident to happen. There are tractors, farm equipment, UTVs, bicyclists, pedestrians, and wildlife that move on these roads. There are multiple houses and field driveways that branch off of these roads. And as Diane Sudbrook showed you last time we were all together, her photographs demonstrate that these are not flat open roads. 
The other argument offered was that the change, that a change is coming, so we must accept change. Well, the changes that are coming are three new residences on Morrison Lane and nine new children to our neighborhood, and the opening of St. Charles County's newest park on Forestdale Road. And as Councilman Klinghammer noted in his blog, those parks are meant to bring more people to the outdoors. And so we know that we're going to be seeing more traffic, more hikers, more bicyclists, more walkers, more runners to Forestdale Road. And that will also bring along park maintenance vehicles and multiply the numbers of vehicles going in and out of that very steep driveway entrance to the park. These are not changes that cry out for an increase in the speed limit. Now let's talk about this 85th percentile study that the engineer advanced last week. I presume that none of you have seen the actual data. Um, if you have, I apologize for talking about it. But I, have, I myself have reviewed the Morrison Lane study. Here it is. And I asked for the Oberhelman and Forestell studies, but I was told they aren't ready for distribution. Still, I'll tell you, I'd like to see them if they are anything like the Morrison Lane study. The engineer told us that the 85th percentile study his department performed supports the increase of 45 miles per hour. But there's so much more that was not said at that meeting. And that you should know about this 85th percentile mode if you care about safety. Is this on? Mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. Face up, please. Face up. Face up. It'll take just a second. Toward me. OK, here we go. This article, the, fifth, the 85th percentile rule is killing us, is an important article. The NTSB report from 2017, which I'm holding in my hand right here, is the report on reducing speed-related crashes involving passenger vehicles. The National Transportation Safety Board says that the 85th percentile method is outdated and incomplete. This 85th percentile method was developed in the 1940s and the 1950s when we had much fewer vehicles on the road. We did not have cell phones. People weren't texting when they were driving. And there was not an epidemic of road rage like we have now. The 85th percentile is also based on a faulty assumption. The assumption is that drivers are reasonable, that they will pick a comfortable speed to travel, and that the comfortable speed is a safe speed. Now, our own daily driving experiences prove otherwise. There are lots of drivers on our roads who are not reasonable and do not respect the speed limit and do not respect the rules of the road, or us. There are many more of those people than there were in 1940 and 1950. The NTSB reports that the 85th percentile method is also faulty because it does not account for all of the factors affecting safe speed limits. It only looks at speeds of vehicles on the road, and it ignores critical factors like annual crash history, road characteristics, shoulder conditions, grade and alignment, and sight distances. It pays no attention to pace of traffic, roadside development, or environmental pedestrian activities or parking practices. The other dirty little secret about the 85th percentile method is that the results are skewed to increase the speed limit. That is, the more drivers who travel at higher speeds, the higher the safe limit is set. So let me give you an example of what that means. If your subdivision has a wide, flat road with a 25 mile per hour speed limit, and 85% of the drivers race down that road, then the 85th percentile says that the safe speed for that road is 45 miles per hour. The 85th percentile does not account for how many kids on bicycles ducked for cover, how many mailboxes were demolished, how many walkers were struck and maimed or killed. They don't care about those statistics. <clears throat> the NTSB also calls the 85th percentile number a moving target because, interestingly, the 85th percentile is not a stationary point. So once you set the speed limit at a higher place, the, the fact is vehicles then start traveling faster. And so then it's time to reset it. So you're just basically getting an increase every time as a result of setting it, these speeds according to the 85th percentile. I want to show you, oh, I want to talk to you about the Morrison Lane study. And I apologize that you can't see these numbers perhaps as well if I had made them bigger. But anyway, 
This is a summary of the data from the County Highway Department's two studies done in September of 2018. Gentlemen, this equipment was set up at my driveway. The data shows that more than 55% of the drivers on Morrison Lane are already traveling well in excess of the proposed 45 miles per hour. This is the county's data. Many are already driving 55 to 75 miles per hour on my lane. For example, on three days of the 924 study between 3 and 6 p.m., there were always 11 cars that drove in excess of 50 miles an hour, some up to 70 miles per hour on our lane. The data proves that what 90 residents, 90 residents and voters have actually observed, there is a horde of unreasonable drivers whose recklessness is not going to end with increasing the speed limit to 40 or 45 miles on these roads. And the county's 85th percentile model wants you to give them permission to drive faster. Here are the petitions signed by those 90 people. And this whole group back here, they're, they're among those people who signed this petition. Valid speed studies prove that electronic signs that tell drivers to watch their speed and consistent enforcement of safe speed limits make roads safe, not increasing the speed limit. These requests before you to increase these speed, li speed limits should be rejected out of hand as unsafe. The whole idea is safety. And so I would urge you to hear these 90 people who live on these roads and off of these roads and drive these roads and have families on these roads and vote against increasing these speed limits. All of these people trust you to take your responsibilities for public safety seriously. Because our lives, the lives of farmers in our area, the lives of school bus drivers, and first responders who drive emergency vehicles on these roads and who have signed this petition, and the lives of their families depend on you acting as good stewards with regard to safety. To increase the speed limits in the face of this evidence, including the county's own data, is a reckless and indefensible approach I tell you that your constituents, the people who live and work in these roads, deserve much, much better from you. And I hope that you will give it to them by denying these increases. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Wilson. Good evening. My name is Karen Wilson. I am a resident um, who lives on Forestell Road. And so I would like to speak um, on behalf of myself and other pedestrians who use the road. So I am a bicyclist. Um, I bicycle every, all throughout the year. I am that person the neighbors would know. <laughs> I'm always on the road at the same time. Um, I'm that single bicycler, the wild woman who will be riding in 20 degree weather. If as it is now, 35 miles an hour, people don't go 35 miles an hour. They don't even tap the brakes when they're passing me. To raise that even more is going to be more detrimental. There has been times, there has been two times, um, uh, two times that when I, because I, where I am at, um, there's S-curves, and people going around the S-curves too fast and out of control have run me off the road. One was gracious enough to stop to see if I was all right. One just kept on driving. So, you know, 35 miles an hour means they're blowing past me at 50, 55, even the, um, the girl who talked before me. I mean, the speeds, I, I, I can tell even on a bicycle. Um, I just think that, you know, I'm speaking for the people that when I bicycle, I, I um, bike past the same people walking their dogs, jogging, walking as well. I'm all year round, like I said, I'm a little about it, but um, you know, I am at the same time every day and people are used to me. I really am, I see people you know, that I were talking and at a restaurant or something, and I'm the bicyclist, they, they know who I am. But if it is raised, it's just, it's, it's, I, you know, speaking for myself, honestly, I'm, obviously I don't wanna lose my life. But if you're in a vehicle and you're involved in something like that, you maybe have a little bit of defense. If somebody going, I am defenseless, but I still have the right to use the road. So my concern is distracted driving, the texting. I, I 
I don't even, people don't even slow down. They don't even tap their brakes when they go past by me. And so that is where my biggest concern is, not as a person who might get pulled over because I'm not particularly going 35. I mean, you know, but I'm not asking for as a driver that I should be allowed to drive faster. I am speaking for the people who actually have the right to use the roads as a pedestrian. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Michael Dempsey. My name is Mike Dempsey. Uh, I live on Forestell Road. See this lady all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a helmet. Um, you didn't run her off the road, did you, Mike? <laughs> no. Okay, just saying. No, no it, it, it really wasn't me. Um, but what I will say is that um, I've got kids, little kids, um, getting on the bus on that road. And that road is, I mean, I wouldn't say drop the speed limit on it, but 35 is kind of iffy as it stands. I mean, I've had my mailbox run over, um, car parts laying in my front yard from where they hit the mailbox and blew the mailbox part. Um, I've had neighbors, uh, several neighbors, who have car tracks out into their yard because the curves are too much to take at the 35 miles an hour as it stands right now. So if your consideration for doing this is that we wanna turn like lawbreakers into not lawbreakers, I think that's a slippery slope. I think that changing the law to keep people from breaking it and they can just continue doing as they please, I think that that's, like I said, I think that's a slippery slope. If the consideration is time for Forest Hill Road, it's 4.9 miles long. I'm not a mathematician, but the way I figure it, it's about 8.57 minutes to drive down that road at 35 miles an hour. At 45 miles an hour, it's 6.6. .6. You're talking about less than two minutes of time saved. There's a highway north and south of those roads. There's no reason to make that a high-speed road when you've got a high-speed road on either side of it. So it wasn't as eloquent as my uh, cohorts here, but um, I wanted to add those couple of points in there. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Cudahy. Good evening, Council. Thank you for taking time to uh, let us speak today. My name is Chris Cudahy. I live at 2532 Oberhelman Road, uh, 42 years at that residence. Um, I'd like, like to start off by saying that I am opposed. Um, again, I am a 29-year veteran of Wentzville and New Melly Fire Protection District. First responder for 29 years. Ran a lot of accidents, fatality bus accidents on that, on, in that area, not on Oberhelmet or Sneak, but in that area. With that said, if we increase these speed limits, I think all we're doing is increasing the, the danger of, of worse accidents happening. Um, I think Diane showed some pictures of Oberhelmet and Sneak Road, I, which I use every single day, which is a huge blind spot. We've had multiple, multiple accidents at that location. Uh, would hate to see a bus involved there. There is kids that get catch the bus right there, and there's cars that pop over the hill on Sneak Road, right in front of Oberhelman, uh, frequently. Um, very, very dangerous intersections. Um, I would encourage any council member to drive 45 miles an hour down Morrison Lane, especially when you get close to Highway N. If your head does not hit the roof of your car, I'd be very surprised. Um, am I? <laughs> it's uh, seriously. Before any vote, please take time to listen to the folks and, uh, and do your due diligence. Um, I have a few pictures, if it's okay, to show. Um, uh, I've raised livestock on that property. I was raised at this place. I showed cattle and raised cattle on this property. My, my sons have raised and showed cattle on this property. Um, we have since sold all of our livestock due to the fact that I am worried. I had the, the extra insurance rider on my insurance policy in case calves or horses got out. I've, I've done away with everything because the people are driving way too fast. Um, I am excited to see what the study comes up with. Uh, like the gentleman said, uh, 35 is too fast in a lot of areas. It really is. Um, face up, yes. This is a couple horses from the snowfall that we got recently from my neighbors that uh, while well, we're walking down over Hellman Road when I was on my tractor pushing snow. Um, this is a frequent occasion where you have horses and livestock out, they get out of the fence, it happens. Um, if, 
if you were to hit a horse at 35, that's bad enough. But if you hit a horse at 45 or 50, we've had, we've had horses when there was a horse barn on 40, 61, uh, many fatality accidents right there on 61 when there was a ho big horse barn there. Um, don't want to see anybody hitting a horse there. I also spoke with the school district and they were unaware of this and uh, they had, they were not happy with, with, with the speed changes as well. So I encourage you to reach out to Dr. Um, or, or, or uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. King. Uh, please talk to uh, Kevin Armour at Daniel Boone Elementary. Um, there's a, a gentleman that just started with the uh, school district that's a, that's a part of the safety facilities. His name is um, uh, Mac Ober. I spoke with him. He was upset that they didn't know anything about this. Francis Howell is getting ready to take over their bus. First student next year will be out. Francis Howell is taking over their school. This is a, 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 a section of Oberholland Road just up from Freeze Lane. As you can see, the road disappears. There is two driveways right on the other side of that hill that children, young children, get off the school bus. I drive this way home from the firehouse every day, and I catch that school bus dropping off those kids every day. If I'm doing 45 or 50 miles an hour over that hill, I'm going to hit the back of that bus. It's not safe. Diane may have showed this intersection. Well, I'm sorry, this is, this is not the same one she showed. This is just a perfect example. Again, I am not doctoring any of these pictures. All these pictures came from Google Earth. Uh, that, I, that I took off my uh, computer. This is a stroller, a lady walking a baby stroller down over Hellman Road. Very common, I mean very common, very, very common. I've raced probably 20 or 30 half marathons. All my training was done on over Hellman and Forest Hill Road. Uh, and some on the Katy Trail. But ran the road myself and has been run off the road numerous times. Another blind hill. There's just t tons of blind hills on Oberhelman. It's not a flat farm road, it's not. I did take a few pictures of Sneak Road. I know there's a school bus stop on the other side of this S-turn. Um, the, the Google map is a little dark, but you can't see around that S-turn. Very, very sharp. Another picture on Sneak Road, road construction, which is common out that way. Um, when, the, when the big farm trucks do run off the edge of the road, they do break away the pavement. Uh, we do get uh, some, some uh, you know, road deterioration happening, um, undermining with the water, with the runoff. Uh, the, the driveway in front, of my, in front of my driveway, there's water running across the road today, currently, as we speak. Uh, it's probably ice now, but this, this afternoon when I came home from work, there was water running across the road. Um, you can't do 45. I would love to meet with these engineers and talk with them and show them, uh, my, my, uh, my, give them my two cents. I think Diane may have talked the seventh on this. This is the Oberhelman Road and uh, Sneak Road intersection. Very dangerous, multiple accidents here. Um, so just please take in, in consideration on your vote. Um, obviously, there's a lot of residents against this. I don't know who's for it, really. I don't. Um, I think that's only a few that are actually pushing this speed limit. But uh, as, as a first responder for 29 years, uh, and living on this property for 40 years, I, uh, I highly suggest uh, the, the council to, to do their due diligence. And Joe, thank you for taking my phone call a couple weeks ago. As soon as it came across the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Facebook feed from Diane Sudbrock, I called you and you took my call on a Friday evening late and I appreciate that, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Shemmer, can I just ask you any questions? Yes. Uh, if, if any of the roads are gonna be increased, would, would any, are, are any of them, in your view, are any of them different than the others? Not really. They're they're narrow two lane roads. Um, I could quote the fire code. I'm not going to. I'm not here to do that. I'm the fire marshal for Wentzville Fire Protection District, but I can quote the the fire code and tell you how wide the road should be uh, for for safety for 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 anything, for fire trucks, for ambulances, for pedestrian cars. We're not here to discuss that. But no, I don't think those roads should be anything over 35 miles an hour. In a lot of cases, 35 is fast. It really is. It really really is. Um, I, the truth is my children were not allowed to get our mail from our mailbox because the cars on the straightaway, which is a hill though, in front of 2532 Oberhelman Road, my children were not allowed to go out and get our mail. My wife and I got our mail because we are worried somebody was going to run over our children. And uh, that's been going on since my, I got a 25 year old that just graduated Mizzou and a 19 year old still at home. And they very seldom got our mail as children due to the fact that the cars are driving way too fast. I've called the police numerous times and asked them to, to, to patrol. I drive a fire truck home, a staff vehicle home every night 
and I've been passed by cars in a fire department staff vehicle. I'm doing 40 miles an hour, admit it, 40 miles an hour down over Hellman Road, and I've had people pass me. There is, there, it's, it's just uncalled for, it really is. Thank you, board, for let, let me speak. Exercise my First Amendment, I love it, appreciate it, and uh, please take it into consideration, thank you. Thank you. feel like I should have prepared a speech. Um, I'm just going to talk from the heart. Nervous. It's okay. You can always just say ditto if they've already made your point, too. <laughs> I'm not even here about that road. Oh, okay. But it sounds good Never to mind me. It. So, um, sorry, public speaking isn't my thing. It's okay. Um, my name is Bethany Berg. I live at 817 Innisfree Drive here in St. Charles. Um, I am the one that petitioned for the um, three-way stop at the um, intersection of Innisfree and Sawyer. And um, sorry, I need to pull myself together. Um, I am one of your county social workers, and um, I've been doing that for over ten years. Take a breath. Okay. Good drink. You'll be good. The chief, the chief always has a calming effect. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so anyway, pulls up behind you, but other than that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it's not so calming. Okay, so I, um, I'm in the business of advocating for what is right and protecting, you know, our citizens. And so um, I've been doing that for over a decade at your um, SB40 board. So anyhow, I live on Innisfree, and I petitioned for the three-way stop at the corner of Innisfree and Sawyer. There is a curve at the edge of Sawyer. <coughs> this curve has a blind spot. And it does not allow for the homes um, on the edge of the curve to safely back out of their driveways. One of the thoughts I first had is, why would you buy a house on the edge of a curve if you're going to back up and you know someone's going to be in your rear view mirror? Well, when the subdivision was first built, I did my research, um, there was not a three-way there. Later on, after it was completed, they needed to um, exits out of the subdivision, at least, um, to forms of egress, so to speak. And so Regent was put in, um, and Regent is the curve. Regent is now Sawyer. Um, this is quite a dangerous intersection. Um, there are a lot of bus stops on Innisfree and the adjoining roads, and there is no place for any of the children to cross the road. As a mom, that's worrisome. Um, and it's a huge safety concern just for all of the houses, and, you know, all of our friends, if they're like backing up and there's like, there's so many times where you just have to like, or you have to slam on your brakes because someone's just like right there. And it's just a huge safety concern. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Whistler. The bar got pretty high from the beginning there, Joe. So, well, I'm just the opposite of this lady here, so I, I don't know what to say. Um, I've lived at. Uh, my name is Joe Whistler. I've lived at 721 Sterling Terrace Court for nine years now. Uh, my back door, my patio door, be right here. You would be that intersection. I, it's right on top of me. I, every day, I see this intersection. I see nothing here that's a danger, nothing whatsoever. Um, I'm not quite sure how far down the industry this lady lives. Uh, I thought we had pretty courteous people in our subdivision. And I, Apparently they're not. Uh, maybe she's talking about St. Charles Hills people. I, I don't know. Um, and what is the process for, for these requests? I mean, all of these requests, what, what is the process? Uh, can we request after the speakers are done and uh, Craig comes up here and explains sure. the process? Sure, we'll do that. We'll explain Okay, yeah, because it just seems kind of strange that some of these things are, are even brought before you i mean uh, like this three-way stop i i've been making i've been going through this intersection 
gosh, I'm retired. I don't, I don't stay at home that much. I go, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm through this three times a day easily. I, I don't see anything here. I don't know what, what do we need to stop saying for? Um, I, I don't know if you, do we put up stop signs so people can get out of their driveways? I mean, come on. Uh, I'm looking at this, it just, do the people want a stop sign here because we recently put up a stop sign down at the other end of uh, Sawyer, on the south end there with, with St. Andrews and Sawyer? You know where that, where that is. I mean, do they want one of the North end now? Are they jealous? I, I don't understand. I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. Why in the world, when I go, I will be making these stop signs and nobody's going to be there. I, there has been no wrecks at this at this intersection that I know of. Uh, if there was, I wasn't home. I mean, uh, I'm there at that house at at night. I don't hear any tires screeching. I don't hear any horns honking. I I just don't see what this issue is. I, where does this come from? Who who is? If you're going to put a stop, let's put it this way. If you're going to put Three, three signs at that intersection. There's two more just like that in that subdivision. So then you, you got to put them there too. They're all the same. <laughs> Come on, you got to. It's just not, that's not the way the world should work. Um, and like I said, I, I, I don't know how these things come into play. How do I... We'll learn, I guess. You, he's, that's a good idea. Um, I mean, do, does it take a group of people? Do, does it take one person to bring these in front of you guys? Some of this stuff is trivial. And now, I got to come out here on night and freezing my butt off to come here and tell you that I think this is goofy. That's not right. At least they should be able to call you and tell you it's goofy. Um, that's all on that thing, I guess. I mean, you just need to, I see this every day. This is, it's the back of my house looks right at that intersection. You live in the back of your house, let's face it, everybody does, right? And you, you, everything in the back of your house you're gonna see before you're gonna see. You don't even probably use your front door. You don't, it's just the way the world is. Um, one other comment about this, uh, this intersection at uh, St. Andrews and West Clay. Gentleman here uh, a couple of weeks ago was talking about how they want to uh, have no parking by the apartments there. Uh, there's an easy fix for that. Just, you don't need those two uh, lanes on the right at West Clay coming out. You don't need them. I mean, that, that goes all the way back to the golf course. It was 40 years ago. Uh, you get the golf course going, you got 20 something people that signed a, a letter saying that they can't make that right turn because there's always a car parked there or something. Well, there's a yellow line in the middle of the road there for some reason. I have no idea. I guess that goes back to the golf course also. All you got to do is just leave those people alone so they can carry their groceries in their house in the rain or their babies. Just because they live in apartments, we don't want to treat them like dirt. You know, the other people, they're parking in their garage and you know, unloading their groceries. And to say that there's enough parking there, well, how does somebody that lives two blocks away decide how much parking those people in the apartments have? That's not right. They're people, just like everybody else. Um, just take and move that yellow line to the middle of the street where it belongs, and you'll have. You can't come out when you got two lanes like this going into a uh, nowhere, basically. Can't go straight. This car and this car are in each other's way. This car can't see that way, and this car can't see that way. So just make it one. Move that line over and leave the intersection alone. I'm done. Right. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Joe. Shannon Panagos. Panagos. <laughs> So this is neither trivial or 
um, laughable by any stretch of the imagination. Um, my name is Shannon Panagas. I live at 4640 Shoshone Trail off Kisker Road and Highway 94. 14 years now. I spoke at the last meeting in front of all of you gentlemen regarding a petition. That's how you get things started. Um, to get some kind of help on our street because of a very real problem. After personally experiencing the 10th incident of personal property damage due to um, continuing speeders on our street, um, I have to personally uh, thank Lieutenant Lukenhaus, um, Officer Ham, and um, many of the other officers whose presence on our street these past two weeks has not gone unnoticed. Um, we appreciate all they have done. With that being said, I don't think, I don't, well, I know that alone will and is not going to um, resolve our problem. Once the police presence subsides, our problem will continue. Our speeders will go back to their old ways. And I beg you, as I did last time, to help us in any way, shape, or form, um, along with continued added police patrol and presence, running radar, um, extra stop signs, um, dips at any and every intersection on my street is um, highly encouraged, welcomed, and um, would be incredibly helpful in um, not only my, our, my, my immediate family's life, but many, as you saw in the petition, homeowners on this street's lives. Um, uh, we're still not finished dealing with the most recent incident that precipitated us being before you tonight, which was the hit and run that I explained that occurred on December 22nd. While I'm away visiting a sick aunt who's begun hospice, um, where my son's car was totaled in a hit and run in front of my home. And as I stated before, this is the 10th incident. We're still not done with this. It's not, it's not resolved. We're almost to the end of January. I have had to email code enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Don Whiteside for your patience, kindness, understanding, and quick response. Because we were being threatened to have the car removed before the insurance was able to come out and look at it. We have had to mitigate damages time and time and time and time and time and time again. I'm here begging you. Like, dig, baby, dig. Like, tomorrow, yesterday, I need stop signs on my street. Anywhere and everywhere, the engineers say they can go. I don't know the, hill, the grade of the hill. We're on a hill. We're at the bottom of a curve. I don't know how so many of us have managed to drive it perfectly well in our 14 years being there many times every day without incident, but we have, but there are some that cannot and will not. Shoshone Trail is not going to be a racetrack any longer. Whether I have to stand out there myself and slow them down one way or another. <coughs> Again, I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate all of you gentlemen, your time this evening here, letting me speak before you. 
I appreciate what you do. I am just asking that you do it. Please and thank you very much. Thank you. Alicia Davis. Hi, I'm Felicia Davis. I'm here for the same exact thing. I live at 4636 Shoshone Trail, live right next door to her. I've seen, I've only lived there since June. Was it June? My husband um, is over there. And um, I've seen her son's car get totaled, mailboxes get hit. Um, I called the police, I talked to the lieutenant, had him have officers come out, patrol our street, and they have been pulling people over at least this morning, seven people between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. speeding up and down our street. I have watched two people in the past two weeks blow through the bus stop sign, which is at my driveway, her daughter and my son get off at that bus stop, and I have to physically go out in the street and yell at these people to tell them to stop. Well, Officer Ham that she had mentioned was sitting behind the bus and watched this man blow through the stop sign. It's gonna take one of our kids' lives, and it's gonna make me cry because I can't, I can't do that. I have done everything I can think. I have a little sign I put out there, kids at play, people run it over. They run it over. And I put stop sign, it's of my own stop sign, on a poster board. Nobody slows down. I have pictures on my phone, if I can show them on here, of her son's car. This is the tire. This is the hit and run on her son's car. She has been threatened by our neighbors that live at the back of the subdivision on social media. We're not on social media. We get these text messages from our other neighbors saying that they're, we're gonna tow your car. It's under investigation, she can't move it. Well, she was forced to move it because she was afraid. This is the mailbox this kid hit. I don't know if you can see that. Her mailbox, this kid cleared her driveway, landed in the street. I heard it in my house. My husband heard it. We came out and his windows were busted out. That's how hard he hit these two. He had alcohol on his breath. We were begging the cops to please check him. And they, were, they wouldn't do it. So I talked to Officer Luke and how, or the, uh, Lieutenant about that and he said he was appalled that we even had to ask that. So this is the mailbox. I don't know if you can see it very well. Hit her husband's car. The mailbox hit her husband's car. This is the little dinky stop sign that I have. This is all I got. This street is so long, so long, and there's not one stop sign on it and people speed up and down the, stop, the street and we're so scared someone's gonna get hit. We, have, we pull into our driveway and we put our blinker on and we slow down and people almost barrel into the back of our cars. Nobody can come to our house and park on our street because we're scared their cars are gonna get hit. This is a huge issue. Just, there's a police officer sitting at my driveway. Police officer. <laughs> The snow, there's a police officer. Police officer pulling someone over. Just, she had to put this sign on her car to let people know why her car is sitting in the street. It's none of anybody's business and they should look at that and tell, oh, well, we should slow down. This is a huge problem. There's another police officer, police officer, police officer. I mean, it's just, I've taken pictures. I'm a stay at home mom. I see this every day, it makes me sick. I can't even take my kids for a walk on our street. I have a three-year-old and a nine-year-old. Yeah, we can go to the park, but I'd like to walk in my new neighborhood. And it just makes me sick that I, we just need stop signs. We asked for a three-way stop sign at Arapahoe and Shoshone, but we really need dips on that corner because once you come down that hill, they catch speed and they're hitting our property. It's, it's, it's never ending, we need something. And um, even the police officers agreed, they said they're shocked that there aren't any stop signs on our street, any. So, I don't know, maybe you guys could help us. We're really in need and um, I can't see her get 
her property damage, not one more time. We, we aren't in immediate danger in our house because it's down the hill from hers, but her house is just a target, it's constant. So um, I really appreciate if you guys could do something about that. Thank you. Thank you. Arnie, did you have? Thank you, members of the County Council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff. I'm a County Public Advocate and Citizen. First of all, I'd like to talk about the information proposed. In my opinion, there's so much information from this traffic uh, request that are, that are missing. We're putting the cart before the horse once again by county government and our highway department. The current process is concerning to me. It doesn't work, it's in the dark ages, and it needs to be revamped by administration and our county superintendent of highways, the county engineer. Where are the requests that were uh, given? Where are the actual re uh, requests? Where were the reasons given why the requests were requested? Where are the facts? Where are the studies that I asked for two weeks ago? Where are the staff memos and the emails between county staff that was supposed to be part of the county council packet for you to divulge, research, read, and understand? Where are the reports from the county department? Where are the reports from the county superintendent of highways? We should be involved in the process and not sit idly by at a desk job. We're the county engineers that we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to conduct studies and give recommendations to the county council. I see none of this information in the county council packet. Where's the traffic study that should be required before going forward with any of these issues or requests? These are not good government practices in my opinion. This needs to change in our county uh, why are we not reaching out to our community partners? As we heard from a firefighter and a fire marshal in the Wentzville Fire Protection District, who I think also said he was a volunteer firefighter in the New Mali Fire Protection District, why are we not reaching out to our partners, the fire protection districts that respond to these accidents? Why have we not heard from Dave Todd, our chief of police, and our commander of our traffic safety enforcement unit? Why have we not reached out to our partners, the ambulance district, to see how many calls they responded for traffic accidents and how many transports to area hospitals? Why have we not reached out to the Wentzville and the Fort Zumwalt and Francis Howe School Districts in these issues? I see no reaching out. I've talked to superintendents of two of the districts and they knew nothing about this issue before the county council. We need to change our ways here. Now delving into the facts. On the first one, as I testified two weeks ago, this is not the approach or the method to establish a three-way stop at Deer Creek Drive and Fawn Creek Lane intersection in unincorporated O'Fallon off of Highway P, Missouri Highway P in the O'Fallon region. This is a raceway and it's a speedway and unfortunately the county police can't keep their 20, somebody 24 seven to cut down on the speedway. There's been numerous accidents. I see none of the accidents involved or none of the information in the county council packet. As I said, the three-way stop here at this intersection, if you go and visit and look at the pictures, it just will not work. The traffic calming measures that are on the O'Fallon section of the incorporated city of O'Fallon part do work and have cut down the accidents to zero. So I ask that we look at traffic calming, speed bumps, brick uh, maneuvers, rather than the three-way stop that will actually be effective in this case. Now the five speed limit requests are just ridiculous. You raise the limit to 45 miles per hour, drivers will go 55 miles per hour. We have at least five law enforcement officers in the audience. You could talk to each one of them that I'm sure will give you experience in speeders and pulling over people for traffic citations. The law enforcement standard is you don't pull anybody over for 10 and under the speed limit as it will not trigger a law enforcement action or the initiation of pulling over a driver. A judge in state circuit court or municipal circuit court or even the county municipal court will dismiss a ticket written by a police officer for 10 and under. And this can be verified by Dave Todd, the chief of police. So they don't even waste their time pulling over speeders that go uh, 10 or less over the posted speed limit. So by you raising the speed limit another 10 miles, it's just gonna give them another issuance or another, uh, what do I wanna say, uh, free pass to go another 10 miles without any penalties or any 
accountability or responsibility for their actions. So I ask that you deny all of these speed limit increases. You've heard the testimony from the people of our county and I think it's very clear, very convincing testimony. The writing's on the wall. This is a no brainer. Use your mind, use your heart, use your experience. Do not rush a wrong decision in this case and do the right thing, right, take the right action on behalf of 435,000 residents and not just a few that ask you to do them a favor. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? I have no more cards. Okay. At this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Kalsi to come up and explain the process to everyone. The, the traffic regulation process that the county's had established for, for many years now is that uh, any citizen is allowed to make a request for a traffic regulation change, but in order to do so, they, they, they need to submit a petition with 15 signatures supporting their request. So the list that you see is, is, a, you know, is a compilation of recent requests that we've received with, with supporting petitions um, asking for those measures. At this point, uh, no judgment, no decisions have been made towards that. Uh, the process is here for them to, you know, to give their two cents like they're doing tonight and a couple weeks ago at the, at the earlier meeting. And then following these public hearings, uh, staff will take a look at the conditions at each of these requests and come back to you with a recommendation um, probably sometime in the month of March uh, with, with deadlines and the time it takes to, to, to get through all these. So. Yes. Craig, on uh, the rural road side there in south of St. Charles County, um, you got a little bit of history there. What, when was it? Was the speed limit always 35? What, what's the history on those roads? We have no way of tracking uh, how the speed limits were originally established other than the county code says that all collector and thoroughfare streets will be set at 35 miles per hour. So we believe that the basis for, for those roads and all of our rural roads, and in fact, for you know most of the uh, higher traffic volume roads, not sub, I guess I should say, not subdivision roads are set based on that 35 mile per hour um, description in the county code. When were they, they were gravel, uh, what, in the 80s and 90s, or when did they transfer? Most of them started converting from gravel sometime in the late 80s, mid 90s, I think. Were they 35 when they were gravel? Yeah, yeah, they've all, like I said, we have no, no records of anything, but we assume that they've been 35 since they were, probably since they were first platted. Uh, just based on what the county code says for roads like that. Okay, and back to the, the lady that came up and talked about the 85% rule. Um, what is that, where do you get that criteria from and um, what what does it mean to us? Well, it, I mean, basically, you know, uh, data, like with most technology, data has been collected, I'm assuming, on on motor vehicles and their, and their use of roads for the 100 years. Um, and this 80, 85th percentile has been around for uh, you know, I don't know how long it's been around, but it's a standard that's been followed nationwide. And it basically says, and, and she was right, the, the, the thought behind drivers and their behavior is that most drivers will drive at a speed that they believe is comfortable and safe for that road, uh, regardless of what it's posted at. As you know, some of the residents admitted themselves that they, they drive faster than 35 on some of those roads out there. So what that 85th percentile, it, it assumes that 85% of people are reasonable drivers. So they will drive at a speed that they consider to be safe and reasonable. And, and you know, it, safe and reasonable to one person is different with others, but that 85% are within the reasonable range. So that's where that, that's where that comes from. So to, it, from your study that 85% of the people drive over 45, that from, your, from when you put out the counters, is that the way we're to understand that? Well, it, it's, yeah, I mean, they fluctuate between the different roads, but they actually drive, 85% 85, 85 drive actually a little bit faster than that. But, you know, the, the, the way the standard is set up, it does give the discrepancy to, to lower that speed limit a little bit just to increase that factor of safety. And that's what is reflected in the, um, the regulations that are pending before you is that the data show they're actually driving a little bit faster than that, but we reduced it down a little bit because of some of the factors that the residents talked about tonight. So from, 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 from a highway engineer, from the data that's out there, um, is, it, is, it, um, if, is it a fact that if the speed limit were raised to 45, that people would have the propensity to drive even faster? Not according to what the, you know, again, people drive at a speed that they believe is comfortable, regardless of what the road is signed at. 
So what this does is it, it frees the, the police department from chasing down these people that drive maybe between the 35 and 45. Um, you know, that's really the only difference I see in this. It, it, it really won't affect driver behavior, in, it, you know, according to, this, to, this, to the theories that are out there. So is it, could it be, is it, a, is it, is it a, a statement, would it be a fair statement to say that if this, the speed limit is, is posted as 35, but 85% of the people are going over 45, that that 35 mile an hour speed limit is just a false sense of security because it's not an actuality? Well, it, it's, it's just a, it's a rule that's being ignored, basically. Um, I don't know about the sense of security that you're talking about, but uh, but if 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 85 percent, if, if if unless I misunderstand this, if 85 percent of all drivers on that road are going over 45, and the speed limit's 35, then what's the? I guess what I'm trying to figure out let is me, by let me, keeping let me, it at 35, me, what's it going to change? Let me clarify that a little bit. When I say 85, when I say the 85th percentile, that doesn't mean that 85 percent are driving 45. That means 85 percent are driving at 45 or below. So you could have you could have quite a few of these people may be driving 35. Some may be driving 25. The 85th percentile is the top limit where you know at that limit and below 85% of the drivers are driving at. So there may you know there, that doesn't mean that 85% of the people are driving 45 out there. Okay, so I misunderstood that. I thought that 85% yeah. of the people are going over 80. No, 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 going 45 or under. Okay. So there's 15% that are <clears throat> are exceeding that speed limit. I see. Okay. Okay. That, that is not true. All right. And Let, I would urge you to see the study for yourself. That is not true. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kotowski. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? This will conclude public hearing. Okay. Then we'll move on into uh, public comments. That's the time when any citizen can come forward and speak on any topic. Once a topic is reached, we limit three speakers pro and three speakers. Uh, con, and we ask that you limit your, your, your talking to three minutes. So any speakers signed up? Arnie Dienhoff. Sounds like that. Thank you, members of the County Council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dienhoff, public advocate and resident. A couple of things on the agenda under finance. Why are we buying 12 Dodge Chargers? from a dealership, uh, Landmark Dodge, I believe they're somewhere across Missouri. Why are we buying them instead of St. Charles County Dodge dealerships, supporting our neighbors and supporting commerce, which you propose us to shop in St. Charles County? Why are we taking our tax dollars way across the state? Second thing is, uh, why are we not having our county engineers, we pay hundreds, uh, if not millions of dollars in salaries to do all the engineering on all these highway projects? There's over, probably over a million dollars in projects that you want to consult out to consultants. Makes no sense. And finally, on the agenda, uh, with construction management professional services for a assessment of feasibility study of our corrections department to a Kansas City firm for $265,672, makes no sense. What are we going to be getting for our dollars? Uh, there was a bid from HMN for $98,000 all the way up to Chidichi, which is the best in the uh, region, the five-state region for architects, $652,135 and $1. What, what are we getting? We need an explanation from the director. I don't like this rubber stamping of our tax dollars. I want to hear the director give us why we're spending $252,000 for a study of our jail. Makes no sense. The jail is not that old, folks. Now, Chairman White, how dare you chastise me in December on the council, council floor in this room in front of the county parks director, Ryan Graham? First of all, myself and Ryan Graham were in the middle of a conversation about parks, and you rudely interrupted us. You rudely interrupted our conversation without and abruptly ended our talk because you felt privileged. Mr. White, you owe me a huge apology for your conduct and wrongly accusing me without having all of your facts. 
Mr. I'm here Chairman, to make these I, facts known Arne, to this the public. This is not a platform for your personal you need to, uh, endeavors. I have the we, freedom of speech. About this Joe, Joe, he well, has, you're the chairman, and he's directing at he you, has, which is against our county rules. But if you want to have this conversation on a personal level, you can have it. But you're just grandstanding. The, the, the county councilor stated that the Supreme Court rules allow me he to does. state you facts. You can be rude and insult people all day long. I'm not you calling come up you here names. every meeting, and this is what you do. I'm not calling you names, and I'm not threatening you, Joe. He has the right we don't do that to anybody else. He We're not right rude, and we don't criticize people. He has the right Just to speak. Just be polite, for God's sake. He has the right to I'm speak. I'm very polite and very respectful. I feel in this condition, some council members are respectful. please proceed. Could you please restore my minute and a half that was taken off by <laughs> Mr. Brazel's interruption? <clears throat> <laughs> Anyways, um... Mr. White, you owe me a huge apology for your conduct and wrongly accusing me without having all the facts. You accuse me of being in an election celebration without an invitation from you. You stated it was your sole party and you paid the bill. Here are the facts. The party was sponsored by State Representative John Weeman, the 103rd District, Tony Lavasco, State Rep, 64th District, Mike <laughs> Elam, the County Council, and yourself, Mr. White. I was invited and asked to be there by State Representative Tony Lavasco. I was, asked, I was asked to be there by Missouri House Speaker Pro Tem, John Weeman. I was not there for you, Mr. White. I was there for them. Arnie, I let you go over time, so thank you. He I, interrupted me a minute and a half. You're not going to restore that time? I'll give you 30 more seconds. Go thank ahead. Thank you. You, Mr. White, and Mike Elam personally went out of your way to speak badly and unkindly and, uh, you know, badmouth me at this party. John Yvette Weeman paid the bulk of the cost, and Tony Lavasco paid an equal amount. Mike Elam, and, Mike Elam and Mr. White, you paid a smaller amount. I was invited and had, had a right to be there to celebrate the milestones with my friends who won, sell, who won state election on November 6th. Should I pay you, Mr. White, $1 for the dry, lousy time. piece of pizza I had? Arnie, Arnie, your time is up. And, I, and I'll continue at the next meeting. I thank, thank you. thank you for your comments. I thank you for listening to me. All thank right. You. Very good. Are there any other speakers? No. No? Seeing none, then we'll move on to uh, the oral report from the County Executive Elman. No report this evening, well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Elman. Seeing that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve or anything to be oh. removed? Hang on a second. I'm wondering if the County Executive wants to rethink the no oh. report. Yeah. I don't have any report. Ms. George does. Oh, okay, very good. Mike, where's I apologize for forgetting about that. No, thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to mention to you all that this week we will be meeting with all of the cities uh, in the county, primarily among of our smaller cities, to discuss our ongoing um, services that we provide to them through the Department of Community Development, primarily for building and code enforcement and neighborhood preservation. So we've had contracts with many of the small cities that have gone on for decades under a couple of different council authorizations for um, mirroring contracts, but some of them over time have come to differ only by minor words, which has left us in a very difficult spot to try and consistently apply those contracts to all the cities. So when we'll be meeting with them tomorrow to let them know that we're going to present to you in the month of probably March um, a new blanket contract that would cover all of the services that any city could receive from community development, and they can select from a menu of those services so that we've got all of them cleaned up. They'll all be identical, and we will know no matter which jurisdiction we're in, we're providing the same service in all locations. So if you hear from New Melly or Augusta or West Alton, that's what you're going to be um, hearing from them about, and that's what we'll be working through some of that language over the next month or two. They'll be able to submit comments to us over about a 30-day period, and we'll incorporate all of those changes into one contract and get all of those before you probably in March. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ms. Thanks. George. Now moving on to the consent agenda. Is there anything to be removed or a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, the consent agenda has been approved and we move on to bills for final passage. Bills for final passage, bill number 4677, an ordinance adopting the master plan of the County of St. Charles, Missouri entitled Master Plan and Vision 2030. Any questions or comments? I have a, a addendum. Okay. Um, uh, Michael, 
How do I refer to this map? The one that you want us to make an... There was a typo. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a typo or not. It's something that got missed. Okay, I got it. The motion is necessary to replace the existing land use map for bill number 4677 and replace it with the revised map correcting Avondale subdivision. It's Avondale subdivision is a three acre subdivision. They had it drawn as a four right. homes per acre. So we're just changing it across the creek there. A second. Okay. Okay, uh, the second and is there voice? All in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's approved. Is that the only one? Okay, bill number 4677 has been approved. We'll Actually, move on it to was just the amendment. Oh, to the amendment. oh okay, now we go on to voting on the bill. <laughs> yes. Okay, any questions or comments on the amended version? Seeing none. Bill number 4677, an ordinance adopting the master plan of the County of St. Charles, Missouri, entitled Master Plan and Vision 2030. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Bill 4677 has been passed. We'll move on to 4678. Bill number 4678, an ordinance approving a standard form agreement to provide mosquito control services to municipalities and authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute these agreements. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. An ordinance approving a standard form agreement to provide mosquito control services to municipalities and authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute these agreements. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember Brass? Yes. Bill 4678 has passed, and we move on to 4679. Bill number 4679, an ordinance approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Missouri Secretary of State for a grant awarded to the Election Authority for an Election Efficiency Grant to assist with election activities, systems and equipment maintenance, voting equipment purchases, maintaining voter lists, and polling place accessibility. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. An ordinance approving an <coughs> intergovernmental agreement with the Missouri Secretary of State for a grant awarded to the Election Authority for an Election Efficiency Grant to assist with election activities, systems and equipment maintenance, voting equipment purchases, maintaining voter lists, and polling place accessibility. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Bill 4679 has been passed, and we move on to uh, bills for introduction. Bill number 4680, requested by Joe Brazel and Dave Hammond, sponsored by Joe Brazel and Dave Hammond, an ordinance amending sections 405.200.C and 405.210.A of the Ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, the Unified Development Ordinance relating to slopes and common ground. Any questions or comments, gentlemen? Yeah, we didn't get a summary on this one, so if, if somebody could, before the next meeting, just let us know what, what the, the the impetus and the gist really was to, to get this done. Well, Mr. Watson did call me and re say that he would do that, but I didn't think this is just some uh, clear, I, you know, we've been working on the EDO and some of the changes, and these are just some uh, clarifications that they had to make on, on common ground areas. But that's, yeah, you, but that's what, okay. I didn't really, this wasn't, this just came from them. It gives some latitude yeah. in about uh, the slopes, <laughs> and I'm just curious where that came from. Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good. We'll move on to 4681. Bill number 4681, requested by Ryan Graham, sponsored by Mike Elam, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a first amendment to lease agreement between St. Charles County and St. Charles Community College for College Meadows Park. Any questions or comments, gentlemen? Seeing none, we'll move it on to 4683. 82. 82. 82. Bill number 4682, requested by Ryan Graham, sponsored by John White an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute an intergovernmental cooperation and reimbursement agreement with the Metropolitan Park and Recreation District, doing business as the Great Rivers Greenway District, District and municipal partners for the development of a master plan for a series of parks, trails, and greenways in St. Charles County, Missouri at a cost to the county of $60,000. Okay, then we'll move on to 4683. Bill number 4683, requested by Steve Ellman, sponsored by John White, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute an agreement with the University of Missouri Extension Council of St. Charles County to provide educational programs and services at a cost to the county of $100,000. Very good. That concludes bills for introduction, and we move on to 46. announcement miscellaneous. Anybody have anything? 
Motion, motion to adjourn. For, no, wait Second. a minute. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I have something to add. Okay. I would like to acknowledge Mr. Dinoff's request for an apology, and I sincerely apologize if I did anything to uh, cause him distress or, uh, or anything else. I publicly apologize. With that, is there a motion for adjournment? So, so moved. Second. All right, we are adjourned.